Hello, I'm Rhoda Weiss, co-chair of this Becker's Conference and a national healthcare consultant. We're honored today to have Geisinger President and CEO, Dr. Jay Wan Ru as our keynote. Geisinger's $6 billion Pennsylvania system has 24,000 employees, 2,000 affiliated physicians, nine hospital campuses, Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, a health plan with 560,000 members, research institutes, a thousand research trials, and is building two behavioral health facilities. Listed as modern healthcare's most influential people and clinical executives at Geisinger, J. Wan's closing the care gap and driving new approaches to some of healthcare's most complex problems. Welcome, J. Wan. Thanks, Rhoda. It's always good to see you. Great to see you. Uh, what's amazing about you is you have this background like none other. Your experience as an ER physician, a leader at Humana, at an academic medical center in the VA, a policymaker at CMS and MedPAC makes you uniquely qualified to lead a prominent health system during uncertain times. How have all these varied experiences shaped your leadership and vision? Well, I think it's a couple things. I think uh, one, it's uh, wanting to be part of the solution rather than perpetuating the problem. And I think that policy lens brings an awful lot of that perspective. I think the other though, is being rooted in the communities that we serve and really trying to understand the problems we're trying to solve for and what the solutions could be that, that would make them um, a lot better. I think it goes hand in hand with the power of combining the payment and the delivery of healthcare. I think that's where we've seen the greatest promise and the greatest ability in building out some of these programs. Thank you. You know, it's um, when it comes to value-based care, people talk about it, but no one lives it more than Geisinger. So despite advantages for patients, employers, and payers and communities, value-based care is still proceeding slowly. What's its future and how can we get people on board? Well, I think it takes the right environment. It really takes a willingness and a wanting to build programs and meet people and communities closer to where they are. And oftentimes that's in the home, in the clinics, in the virtual sphere. And all of those environments are notice, you know, they're not the hospital. And so I think it takes a commitment to actually wanting to move care outside of the traditional sites and having the right payment incentives to do that. I think that's what coming together and creating that environment, that's what makes it possible. And so oftentimes it's, you gotta have that willingness, but you also need a willing uh, payer partner that creates that environment. For us, you know, having our own payment, uh, having our own insurance company obviously powers that, but now there are other ways to do it too, whether you're partnering with another payer or doing programs like the ACO program with Medicare or even direct contracting. You know, let's talk about value-based care and your Medicare Advantage 65 forward concierge service. Longer appointments, high-end service, $0 premium for those who likely could never affair, afford concierge care. There's less admissions, less ER visits. You're capturing and resolving chronic conditions, addressing social determinants of health, like isolation via exercise and social activities. Tell us more. Well, I think it's rooted in the belief that um, one size does not fit all when it comes to primary care. And in the case of the care of folks 65 and older, higher uh, disease burden, more commonly they come with chronic diseases. And so you just need more time and you need a comprehensive set of programs. And when we put those things together, the wellness programs and the clinical care, longer appointments, smaller panel sizes, we have seen 20 to 25% decreases in the rate of inpatient admission, 40% decreases in the rate of ER use, and our patient satisfaction is literally at the top 98th percentile of others out there in the clinic environment. And so I think that's truly an, a, a good example of where everything is sort of a win-win-win, win for patients, a win for us, a win for the community. Uh, we're super excited and we're looking forward to building many more. We'll have probably about seven or eight of these open by the end of this year. That's so impressive. I want the rest of the world to have it as well. Um, another thing that stands out about Geisinger is that you serve many rural areas. So what are the challenges and how do the economics of these communities impact care delivery programs, especially with 
the customized programs and the amazing innovation that you're doing in the rural areas that most people are not doing, but you're doing and you're making a huge difference in their lives. If you came to many of the areas that we serve, we have rural areas and also smaller semi-urban areas. But the common theme here is socioeconomically, we serve a lot of depressed areas and vulnerable populations spread apart by huge distances. And when you're talking about rural, we, we probably have about 20% of our area that is not even covered by broadband and doesn't have any public transportation. So you put these challenges together um, and it really requires a care model that goes upstream, addresses issues and prevents things before you land at the downstream ER visit or the admission into the hospital. Um, it behooves us and our communities to invest in those kind of programs, whether it's food, transportation, um, or other social determinants. Um, that's what we have to do because those are the needs of our communities. So let's talk about innovation. Your commitment to address the root causes of diseases rather than just the symptoms to improve long-term outcomes and decrease healthcare costs. For example, you're redesigning care with Primary Care Redesign, the College of Medicine Scholars, and Convenient Care Plus. Tell us more about these. So we're big believers that when you have access that's a lot easier than landing in the ER, um, good things tend to happen. I think as an ER physician myself, a lot of people land there because they have difficulty accessing other sites of care. And so we've actually focused quite a bit over the last several years on improving that outpatient access, creating multiple sites of outpatient access and making that be the path of least resistance. And when we've done that, people's health outcomes have been better and they've been a lot happier with their experience as well because they're getting their care needs met in more convenient locations. Jay Wan, you have done some remarkable things with your medical school in terms of really looking at what we need from physicians in the future. Tell us more about that. Well, you know, our medical school was born out of the community, much like Geisinger was. And as a result, we always pay attention to what our community needs are. And for our communities, primary care is front and center of where we know uh, the needs will be, and that's true across the country. And so uh, just in the last 18 months, we launched the Primary Care Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program, which uh, pays for full tuition and support uh, for up to 40% of our medical school class if they're in some of the high need specialty areas. For every year of support, they agree to do a year of service back to Geisinger at the completion of all their training. It is tremendous. Uh, we've seen huge uptake in terms of applicant interest. Um, and these will be areas like primary care and behavioral health. And of course, the other 60%, it'll still be all the other specialties that make medicine and healthcare fantastic. And so um, we're not turning our backs on that, but now we're able to also bring this offering to continue to encourage people to go into areas of high need like behavioral health, primary care, um, and whatever other needs we identify in the coming years. Jay Wan, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic, the biggest gap, it's almost a, another pandemic of its own, has been the lack of mental health services. You are building two mental health facilities. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it, it's a tremendous need across the country and our communities uh, as well. And I think it goes back to you know, really taking a look at what do our communities need? What do they deserve? And what's gonna improve the aggregate health of the communities that we serve? And behavioral health is one of the big areas. And so we knew we had to expand our capacity to accommodate that growing need. At the same time, building programs on the outpatient side so that people hopefully don't need to land in those facilities. And so we're doing both. We're also supporting it through our Abigail Geisinger's uh, Scholars Program at our medical school. And um, it's something that we, I think, unfortunately, for years to come, we're going to have to keep building um, until we can really tackle that upstream at the same time that we're looking at all the other ways that we can go further upstream and, and solve for the medical issues. So uh, it's something we're proud of, something we're really excited about. But at the same time, um, we hope that we're not racing from behind, but we're still catching up on that one. All these programs are great. You know, Geisinger has built a national reputation for innovation, proven care, my code, proven experience. Each has been so meaningful to their communities. Let's go over a few of those. Uh, one of my favorite, 
that is so important is free to be moms that are helping moms face an addiction through pregnancy in the first two years of their child's life. Tell us more. Yeah, I think that's a that's been a winner of a program for us, and more importantly, our patients and communities. We know that uh, drug addiction, opiate addiction, uh, is real. We know that it's out there in the communities, and in particular, it's a challenge for everybody. Uh, but it's especially a challenge for pregnant moms, and even beyond the immediate pregnancy, just getting back on their feet um, and and really supporting them through the first couple years after childbirth whether that's medication assistance therapy or other social services, getting them the social support that they need so that the mom side of things, it's a little bit easier. And so I think that's a, a program we've seen a lot of success with. Well, we hope to continue to build on that. And uh, it's really part and parcel of the notion of going upstream and figuring out how to address issues even outside the traditional healthcare environments. You know, there was this big announcement, organizations getting into more home care that's with patients that are more acute, but you already have it. You have Geisinger at home. It's bringing care teams to the sickest patients to reduce hospitalization. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so we've been doing this about two and a half years now, and it's been a, a huge success. It, as you mentioned, it's about, you know, it's probably the sickest 3% of our patient population. And it's a population that has difficulty getting to the care. And so we bring the care out to the patient in their homes. And by doing so, avoid a lot of the need for the downstream ER or the hospital admissions. What we'd like to do is continue to build on that by expanding so that it's not just chronic disease management in the home, but also acute care services. So think of these hospital in the home models that I know many folks have read about. We're continuing to expand into those kinds of services as well so that the suite of offerings and capabilities of what we're able to deliver inside of people's homes um, continues to expand. And so we're super excited. We know that families are excited and of course the patients are excited when we bring these things as well. You know, there's this race to innovate with remote patient monitoring and artificial intelligence. What's new for you in these areas? We recently came up and launched our new chronic disease monitoring program. It's termed Connected Care 365. And really the idea is to combine the remote monitoring aspect with the artificial intelligence to glean insights that can be more proactive um, and anticipatory in terms of generating uh, information about patients and prioritizing who the care team should be uh, touching soon and, and next. Um, I, I know that uh, when we've done this with our pilot and the pilot touched 700 to 1,000 people, uh, we saw tremendous impact. And by the end of this year, we anticipate touching uh, over 9,000 patients. And so we're gonna continue to expand on that. The second um, sort of update for you is we were recently awarded second place in the CMS Artificial Intelligence Health Outcomes Challenge. And so that was something that I know the team was really uh, excited about. Over 300 applicants or um, you know, other organizations who participated in that challenge, we came in second. Of course, it would have been nice to come in first, but that was also a partnership with Medial Early Sign, which is a company that does artificial intelligence. It's all about the early detection and prevention of higher disease burden um, areas and same kind of model using artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, getting anticipatory and proactive in uh, getting further upstream with managing the diseases. These last 18 months have been like none other. What have you learned about yourself as an executive and about leadership in general? You know, I think it's been a reinforcer and a reminder that communication and honesty and transparency, all of those things that um, sometimes we need those reminders. And, and those have been the things that have been critically important. Um, it's okay not to know what's coming around the bend. Um, and when you're sharing that with your folks and your team and the communities, I think they understand that you don't know everything at every moment. And um, despite that, if you're willing to be transparent and authentic and communicating every step of the way, I think it helps everybody navigate through the uncertainty. And that's been uh, a big piece of, I think, what we've learned over these last 18 months and uh, the approach we've taken, um, not just within our organization, but with the communities as well. 
Final question. You have so much experience in so many areas, including policy with CMS and also with MedPAC. What, if you could tell the world or tell the country what we should be doing, what would make for a more perfect healthcare community for those we serve all over the country? I think the more we can think broadly and holistically around what improves people's health and population's health and focus on what improves the community's health, I think building those programs and focusing on those programs, ultimately we all win. If we could keep our focus and our North Star on the community and the improving the health, um, I think we'll do worlds of good. And I think it's doable. And I think we are making progress. You know, for those of us who've been in healthcare for many decades, we are so confident of the future because we have a remarkable leader and an innovator like you. I can't wait to see what's next for you and Geisinger. And thank you so much for keynoting our conference today. Thank you, Rhoda.